I just want to start by welcoming everybody here. Um, and uh, I'm, yeah, thank you. Uh, and I want to begin with the land acknowledgement. I, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years. It has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so it's my uh, pleasure uh, of introducing today's speaker, also my challenge. Uh, I was given a 20-page uh, CV uh, to look at uh, before today, so, uh, um, but it's really a great honor to introduce Today's speaker, uh, Magda Tedder, I've known for several years now already, uh, at least like, uh, seven, eight years. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, uh, and I can really say just an impressive scholar and a, a simply wonderful teacher. I, one of the people we don't usually get to see the people who've been uh, scholars um, that come to the University of Toronto to teach in action. And uh, she's just uh, simply uh, outstanding in person. So I think we're in for a treat today. Um, I will say, uh, that uh, she is professor of history and the uh, Schwidler Chair of Judaic Studies at Fordham University, uh, where she's been since 2015. Um, uh, she's the author of uh, four books now, the newest one coming out soon. Uh, her early work was on post-Reformation Poland, um, uh, but she's since gone on to uh, uh, expand her the scope of her work. Her uh, last book that came out was called Blood Libel on the Trail of an Anti-Semitic Myth, which is quite broader in historical scope. And um, her newest book um, is um, Christian Supremacy, Reckoning with the Roots of Anti-Semitism and Racism, which will come out with Princeton University Press. If you go to the website of Princeton, University Press, uh, you can download the introduction and table of contents and it will be out soon. Um, uh, her books have won uh, several awards, the uh, 2020 National Youth Book Award, the George L. Mosse Prize from the American Historical Association, the Ronald Bainton Prize from the 16th Century uh, Society. Um, and uh, she has herself uh, held any number of numerous and prestigious uh, positions uh, and awards the, from the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers, uh, and she's also president currently of the uh, American Academy of Jewish Research, the, sort of, uh, the oldest and certainly still most prestigious body of uh, Jewish research that there is uh, in the world. Um, uh, today's topic, I think, comes out of her new book. The title is Enduring Marks of Inferiority, on the common roots of anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism. So uh, please join me in welcome my guest. Thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for having me. I am just sort of trying to figure out my um, the share screen function and so I can share this slide. It's a great pleasure to be in the city of Toronto, one of my favorite cities in the world. And I was just very sad to, uh, to discover that Greg's ice cream is no longer on Spadina and Blur, but I guess that's uh, just life. Cities change, businesses change. And um, so this book is indeed, uh, this, this talk is indeed uh, part of the uh, the book. And this was actually the title I wanted the book to come out of, uh, under, The Enduring Marks on Inferiority. But none of my books have come out under the titles I propose. So I've sort of given up on fighting over books titles. So don't judge the book by its title, <laughs> judge, judge it by the content of, of the book. Uh, so uh, the, the book is really, uh, you know, we're in Canada, the book is really um, inflected and influenced by the fact that I've lived in the United States for the last 30 years. And uh, it is not that anti-Semitism and racism are unique to the United States, uh, but these questions and the way they come together are uh, uh, in, in, in different uh, in, in that context because of the U.S. history, especially the U.S. history uh, with uh, uh, enslavement of, uh, of Black people. 
I was, as, as Saul mentioned, I was trained in Jewish studies. I'd written on Eastern Europe. That's where I started my career, pre-modern Eastern Europe. And uh, when I started teaching classes on anti-Semitism, I, I started to um, recognize some connections. And also because my students uh, are very diverse, I tried to make it relevant to them as well. So, um, so uh, I began to see these, these, co these connections. Um, and one thing that really struck me was when in 20, I don't know if anybody has seen this film, in 2016, a film by Raoul Peck came, I Am Not Your Negro, about James Baldwin. And in that film was a clip, which I'm not going to show you, uh, but I will show you the, the passage in which Baldwin essentially challenges white um, Americans saying, why did you invent uh, the Negro? He uses the N word, I won't use the N word, but he uses it for the, for the meaning of the, uh, of, the, of the N word. Why was it necessary to have the uh, Negro in the first place? Because I am not a Negro, I am a man. But if you think I am a Negro, it means that you need him. If I am not the Negro here, you invented him and you white people invented him, then you've got to find out why. And it struck me, it's like, this is the same as the Jew that is invented by anti-Semite. The, the Jew is, has nothing to do with the flesh and blood Jews who lived their lives. It is the invention and the anti-Semites have to an ask, answer this question uh, why they needed it. So that really got me, got me started, and uh, and then I uh, and then I uh, I was reading a lot on black uh, history, and I found myself constantly, um, uh, uh, you know, annotating CF Jews, CF Jews. This this these parallels were very very interesting in in a way. But the study and uh, between anti the connection between anti-Semitism and racism um, has been lost in the 1960s. Scholars before that have certainly, and filmmakers and artists have certainly made this connection, especially uh, since the 1930s, 1930s, 1940s, uh, when Nazis came to power, uh, Black Americans and some um, uh, 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 Jewish intellectuals were making the connection very clearly. Um, this uh, film in, from 1948 makes that connection explicitly, and I recommend this film to you. Uh, it's such a powerful meditation on anti-Semitism and racism. I know it's a, that it's a very powerful poetic meditation on anti-Semitism and racism, and it's really an incredible uh, film. And it has these questions. If, the, if Hitler died, why does his voice still pursue us through the spaces of American life? Um, if we won, why do we look as if we lost? Why is the news still bad? And it sort of looks at the post-war America and the continuation of both anti-Semitism and, uh, and racism and the, uh, the, the, the war and the impact of, of, the, uh, of the war. But again, other scholars, Jewish and uh, and Black, were making these connections in the then 40s and the 50s, uh, uh, and so on. Here we have Franz Fanon, W. E. B. Du Bois. The Commentary magazine in its early decades was uh, filled with with essays and conversations about these these issues. The Crisis, uh, which was the uh, flagship journal of the uh, NAACP. Uh, in the United States, also engaged with these uh, with these uh, questions. Um, so uh, th this is just a list that I made of these as I was reading of these parallels. We will not go through all of it. That's sort of you can read the book if you if you'd like. But I want to just highlight that it is becomes very clear that Judaism and Jews became the contrast figures and constitutive of the Christian identity and Christianity, um, especially through the metaphor of the elder shall serve the younger. And in in uh, a white society, black people, especially in the United States, 
um, but even in the colonial period, became the contrast fi fi figures necessarily for the development of white identity. Uh, but there were other parallels that you'll see, and we'll see later on in the talk about carnality, about uh, uh, insolence or being apathy, and and so on, so so uh, so forth. Um, the fear of Jewish power, the fear of Negro rule, and 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 ultimately the refusal of acceptance of of both Jews and Black people as equal citizens in modern society. Um, this is just a quote from W.E.B. Du Bois in his, um, after he visited the Warsaw Ghetto, in which he says that, that the, the visits to Europe and especially to Warsaw, uh, not, did not so much, uh, uh, the, the result was not so much clearer understanding of the Jewish problem in the world as it was the real and more complete understanding of the Negro problem. And I, for me, um, as someone is coming out of Jewish studies and out of teaching and studying anti-Semitism, uh, exploring anti-Black racism actually it brought clarity about what's different, what's similar, but also in what way these things are different. And I know this is a, a fraught topic and scholars have been sort of avoiding uh, stepping into this, uh, this debate. Um, and, uh, and, but I, I did think that it was a, a, a very, very useful to engage with these, uh, with these uh, topics. So though anti-Semitism and racism are perceived or thought to be modern phenomena, uh, they have much deeper roots and scholars have now been uh, exploring the question of racism in the pre-modern period as well. Um, I argue, uh, and this is essentially what the book is arguing, that there are Christian roots to both, uh, although they don't come at the same time, and that the Indian of power and servitude that Christians applied to Jews from the earliest texts through antiquity on on influences and creates a mental framework for Christians to think about themselves as superior which then later on, on becomes racialized when race enters into uh, the political and economic system. So it starts with Paul. Um, Paul was not an anti-Semite, I will say, uh, but he does create a theological framework of values that he attaches to Jews and Christians, uh, of, uh, of values that are, uh, some are better, some are worse. So he shows, she attaches the law to Jews and faith to Christians. He associates Jews with the slave woman and Christianity with the free woman. He associates Jews with flesh and Christianity with promise. Um, so you can see that these are not neutral terms. These are terms that have value and that one is clearly better than the other. Um, in, a, in Romans, oops, sorry. In Romans, he, uh, he again says that, Jew, that, that Christians are not, uh, that children of the, uh, Jews are the children of the fresh, uh, flesh and the, and the Christians are children of the promise. And crucially, and this is the, the key phrase, if the other concepts had value judgment, um, here, the phrase and the interpretation that it will get later from the book of Genesis, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau, will have an impact on the legal status of Jews in Christ, uh, Christian Europe. And again, that idea of servitude. Um, Augustine, uh, again, uh, it, it, Augustine doesn't just come up, he draws on other Christian writers, but Augustine, one of the most important thinkers uh, and writers and theologians of Christianity, returns to the moti motives, motives that, that uh, Paul has um, created and explicitly ties them to Jews and Christians in the new political reality of Christian Roman Empire. 
that is a Christianity no longer as a persecuted religion, but as a, as a political power. So he, uh, again, associates, uh, draws more explicitly on Jews and carnality and Christianity and spirit, elaborates on these pairs of Isaac and, uh, and Ishmael, Cain and Abel, Esau and Jacob, and Jews are always, even though that's not what the texts say, Jews are always associated with the elder. And the elder is always the problematic one. He's the killer. He is the son of a slave woman. Uh, he is uh, one who is rejected. Um, and he explains in this new historical context, the verse that Paul used in a com completely unrelated uh, context, the elder shall serve the younger. And he says in the city of God, two covenants, the old and the new, a certain uh, part of the earthly city has been used to make an image of the heavenly city. And since it thus symbolizes not itself but the other, it is in servitude. H Hagar, who was Sarah's slave, represented together with her son the image of this earthly city. And since the, the shadows were to vanish with the coming of light, coming light Sarah, who was free and symbolizes the free uh, city. So uh, Christianity becomes the free city. Um, Christianity is associated with freedom and light and Judaism with servitude and, um, and uh, er earthliness. Uh, the elder shall serve the younger, he, he says. Now, scarcely anyone among us has understood it to mean anything else than the older people of the Jews should serve the younger Christian people. The primacy of the elder is transferred to the younger by the compact because the elder passionately craved lentils, the carnality, right? Which the younger prepared for his meal. What could be clearer than the reference in these two promises is to the people of Israelite and the whole world, the former according to the flesh, the latter according to the faith. So this is an expression of Christian supersessionism uh, in these metaphors, but it becomes Christian supremacy when it's applied into law, when it's no longer a theology. And what law does is that it reifies and makes them real and social meaning these theological ideas of superiority inferiority of social hierarchies. Um, this is just one example of Roman law. Uh, no, on no account shall a Jew buy a Christian slave, neither shall he contaminate him with Jewish sacraments and convert him from Christian to a Jew. It was no, it wasn't a, a prohibition on owning Christian slaves. It was a prohibition on Jews owning Christian slaves. Christians could own Christian slaves. It was singling out Jews and removing certain rights from them because they were Jews in uh, effect creating a certain uh, social and political hierarchy. Uh, because the canon law, I'm jumping because we only have 15 minutes, uh, canon law draws very um, uh, tightly from both Roman law and Christian th theology. The, these ideas come um, in uh, canon law in relation to Jews. So Jews are consigned to perpetual servitude because of, uh, of their own guilt. That is what Christians believe was the crucifixion of, of Jesus. Um, they ought not to be ungrateful. They should and not requite Christian favor with intimacy, uh, with contumely and intimacy with contempt. Um, he talks about excesses of Jews that they shall not dare raise necks, their necks bowed under the yoke of perpetual servitude against the reverence of Christian faith. Lest the children of a free woman should be slaves to the children of a slave, but rather as slaves rejected by God. Uh, re and, and again, and he, he repeats, recognize that, that they recognize that they should recognize themselves as slaves of those whom Christ's death set free, at the same time as it enslaved them. Henceforth, the perfidious Jews should not in any way dare grow insolent, right? So there is also this uh, language of behavior of insolence. 
a few centuries uh, and the same phrases come back, that Jews are guilty, consigned to perpetual servitude, that they owe uh, servitude to Christian and th they should not exchange it for dominion. Um, they have erupted into insolence, but the church tolerates them out of their kindness and uh, uh, and hope for, for conversion as long as they're persistent, their are errors. They should recognize through experience that they have been made slaves while Christians have been made free through Jesus Christ, God and our Lord, and that it is iniquities that the children of the free woman should serve the children of the maid servant, right? That, that idiom of servitude and of power and hierarchy is repeatedly applied to Jews in this from antiquity uh, on. We have, and it continues, the echoes continues, maybe not as explicitly as the papal decrees, but this is from Poland from 1945. Um, uh, uh, bishop Kaczmarek, who was a bishop of Kielce, disciple of a year later of um, uh, uh, pogrom, um, he, in his meeting with Jews, he says, you know, Jews are talented merchants, talented doctors, talented lawyers. Poland is destroyed, it needs strength. Why don't Jews do what they are capable of? Why do they engage in politics? Can you imagine what it looks like when a priest comes to the ministry and a Jewish woman is sitting there, God knows from where, and treats our clergy with superiority and insolence? What kind of impression does it make, right? This is a, a, an example of the sort of mental frameworks that these centuries of that rhetoric create that it's applied here to, uh, to post-war Poland and uh, the question of a Jewish position in, in, in power. So the, actually the idea, the trope of Jewish power, I believe emerges from the trope of, of, of servitude, of that uh, language of servitude. So Christian supersessionism, um, it gives Christians the sense of superiority. Then when it becomes uh, an empire and Christian becomes empire, it becomes supremacy because it, it is implemented in law. And then uh, uh, it develops a Christian sense of domination and ent entitlement to positions of power. This is, trans uh, this is, this is uh, visualized then translated into visual language, everybody probably has seen, uh, those who have studied anti-Semitism, the idea of ecclesia and synagogue, this, the, the symbolic representation of the church and the synagogue, the church, the triumphant queen, the synagogue, a, a blindfolded, humiliated maiden, uh, again, uh, ubiquitous. Um, here you have another example of the queen and, and synagogue. This is a really a wonderful, rich painting, which we don't have time to talk about. But in the early modern period, as Europe begins to engage in the transatlantic slave trade in the colonial enterprise, the iconography of the synagogue and ecclesia is displaced by Europa and the continent. The, the, the church, the ecclesia becomes the queen Europa Regina um, here seated. So even some of the body language and positions are very similar, but now the synagogue disappears and it is replaced by the continents that who are in positions of humiliation or, um, or at least uh, to be humbled. Uh, and it continues throughout this period. Um, uh, the, the Europa is always depicted as a queen and these other continents in these, uh, you know, semi-dressed uh, under clad uh, ways of, of, again, primitivism and, and, uh, and backwardness that will be coming. By the 18th century, the height of the transatlantic um, uh, slave trade, Africa, which used to be earlier more or less a Moorish woman, becomes black and uh, Europa is uh, white. Those of you who study uh, French Revolution, that will, uh, that image of Europa will re resemble that of, um, of uh, images of the revolutionary France. 
Um, and but this was but Jews don't disappear in the in the British colonial context. Um, this uh, the the col the colony of Virginia uh, had a, a issued a law that essentially uh, articulated white Christian supremacy. And you'll hear the echoes of that law from Roman times. No Negroes, mulattoes, or Indians, although infidels or, or Jews, Moors, and Ma uh, Mahomedans, or other infidels, shall purchase any Christian servant, nor any other except their own of their own complexion. If any Negro, mulatto, Indian, Jew, Moor, Mahometan, or other infidel, um, shall notwithstanding purchase any Christian white servant, the said servant shall ipso facto become free. So again, certain rights, certain restrictions, now racial and religious affirming Christian supremacy. And here is liberté, which is um, depicted always as a white woman in the vein of that Ecclesia and then Europa. By when the United States rebels against the British Empire and becomes uh, an independent state, gradually America, which is depicted in this racialized uh, savage imagery, becomes a white woman. And so you have racial, racial transformation of America, Colombia is always depicted as a white woman. But there is a, a, a difference. So we have, in terms of racism, we have enslavement coming first, the actual enslavement, not the language of servitude or slavery. But, uh, and then the idea of race is developed. It's not that they are looking to enslave black people because they think that they are inferior. They first enslave then develop ideas of race to justify enslavement, and then the ideology of racism and white supremacy. This is different from uh, anti-Jewish uh, anti sentiments. The idea first develops from theology, then it becomes law in Christian supremacy, and then only that sense of of reification of inferior status. So the, the status comes later, first comes the idea. Whereas with black anti-black racism, the status precedes the idea. Um, this becomes very clear uh, or, or continues in the debates over citizenship during the Enlightenment era, where uh, uh, Europeans are wondering whether Jews should and could be citizens. Uh, does the law of Moses make citizenship and full integration of Jews impossible? They will never become fully integrated the way that Catholics, Lutherans, Germans, Wends, and French live together, right? The implication is uh, religion, Jews do not, cannot be equal uh, because they are Jew, Jews. Um, uh, again, the, the the question of whether the law should grant the Jews whom it always considers as foreigners among us, the quality and, uh, and rights of French citizens and active citizens, right? Can Jews, they're, they're always foreign. Doesn't matter how long they've lived in Europe, they, they are not seen as a part of the, of the newly developing we. The same questions uh, were in other places uh, across Europe. And, uh, and again, one of the debaters articulated whether the outcome of this debate will teach all Europe whether we in the Netherlands honor the rights of men or only of Christian men, the rights of citizen or only the rights of Christian citizen. And now debates co uh, co uh, continued, even though Jews eventually are granted citizen rights, but that rejection of their equality is then manifested in modern political and then racial anti-Semitism. What we also need to see in the uh, in the Enlightenment era, and that is reflected in these in these uh, debates, is the what I call de-Europeanization of Jews. That Jews are now shown as coming from Asia, and that leads to the European ethnic nationalism and racialization of Jews. 
the emphasis is that Jews long for Palestine. They will always look to Palestine. They're more suited for Palestine. There's no longer debate about or discussion about Jews and Christians, but increasingly Jews and Germans. And then again, Jews as foreign are therefore excluded from the sense of, of, of polity and social faith. That comes out of the study of enlightened religions, which casts Jews and puts them in Palestine as one of the early re religions, always showing them with, uh, with animal sacrifices and all kinds of things. And here is just one example from 1705 on the agreement of the customs of East Indians with those of Jews and other ancient people. The Jews are now increasingly described in relation to the non-European cultures. And similar debates uh, continued and, and uh, emerged during the revolutionary era and the enlightenment about the uh, about citizenship and inclusion of people of color, um, even free. And th this is what is most interesting is about the debates over free black people, not those enslaved by free, free black people. There exists among us a class who is naturally our enemy another you know, trope of enmity, which still bears on its forehead the imprint of slavery. That's how uh, the magistrate of Port-au-Prince described the free black people. And then during the uh, revolution, um, the colonial question is a huge question. And those who were debating Jews were also debating the, whether or not uh, uh, black people could be uh, in fact in, uh, included in the um, in citizenship and, and human rights. And you have the quotes from Abbé Gregoire, uh, who notes that these 40,000 in the colonies of individuals free by law, but enslaved by derogatory decrees and prejudice. And, and he's arguing for granting them civil rights, uh, I mean, citizenship, but uh, in the end, um, there is a, a very sort of quirky solution to it that, that technically grants uh, citizenship to, uh, to black people who were born of free uh, mothers and fathers. So that would have been a much narrower. Uh, in, in. in terms of Jews, um, again, this, the, uh, the, the, the kind of reminder that don't, they don't deserve to be, uh, to be citizens, to be equal that it wasn't for them that this birth of new epoch of citizenship and rights um, a, does not really apply to them. The idea of human rights, Bauer said, was discovered for the Christian world in the last century only, not for the Jews. It's not innate to, human rights are not innate to men. Very similar language um, was about uh, the debates over citizenship of of black people in the U US in 1820, the first real debate over citizenship um, uh, spoke about this and argued that it was inconceivable that the framers of the US constitution, when they spoke of we, the people, that they included Indians, free Negroes, mulattoes as slaves, uh, it was impossible. They obviously meant we, the white people, right? It's very parallel to the idea of human rights was discovered only for the Christian world in the last century versus, and the question of the we, the white people. Uh, the infamous Dred Scott case, which stripped black people in America, black Americans of citizenship, uh, articulated that very question. Can a Negro whose ancestors were imported into this country and sold as slaves become a member of the political community formed and brought into existence by the Constitution of the United States and as such became entitled to all the rights and privileges and immunities guaranteed by the instrument to, that, uh, to the citizen? And the answer of that case was no. So what we see in this process, we, we, we see these, uh, these uh, ideas of hierarchy, hierarchy, equality, hierarchy, and power, the modern idea of equality that is uh, bandied about and promoted during the Enlightenment era and the French Revolution, and American Revolution for that matter too, 
uh, clashes with the established frameworks of thought and mental ideas about uh, who, who really should belong in it. Um, modern nations, as they emerge, begin to define the new we. Who are the we, the people? Who belongs to the polity? Who doesn't belong? And again, these questions come clashing when it comes to Jews and, and Black people. Uh, Jews and Black people were therefore excluded from this we and that, uh, and, um, and that perception on inferiority that, that came with the baggage of the centuries precluded the possibility of their equality. Um, their equality came to be seen as unearned usurped power. And we see again that language of Negro power and Jewish power that comes, comes in. In the United States and, and in Europe, Jews were, claiming, were clinging to the idea of religion because that was discrimination on the basis of religion was not acceptable uh, in, the, in the Enlightenment ideas, but race uh, was a product as defined of the Enlightenment period. Uh, even Voltaire uh, and others have, have uh, you know, embraced uh, polygenist theories of, of racial inequality. Now, in a modern time, that inequality was visualized. And here you will see some of those tropes, uh, the parallel tropes that we see. Uh, so here you have, obviously, the, the, the contrast between the Euro um, uh, Americans or Euro, uh, European kind of types with the um, African types. Uh, and racist polygenist book was trying to prove that black people could not have been possibly um, created in the image of God, um, that they must not belong to that. And, and it was uh, an illustrate, illustrated by a number of images, obviously Adam and Eve, shaped by the visual idea from Christian uh, European art. So it could not have been possible the same. Christ is shown as a white man and a white modern man uh, paralleling that. And again, showing it's impossible that black people in that caricature are the same. Uh, here's Mary Virgin and a white little girl. And this, uh, this is a, a, a black child in a co co contrast. Did Merge Virgin Mary and Christ Charles, could the child Christ possibly be of the same flesh as the Negro? Um, note the, the kind of the features of the girl and the and Mary here or the, or the woman uh, over there, uh, the woman here, uh, uh, a white uh, woman, because that kind of um, uh, aesthetic will be applied to contrast with Jews as, as well. Here is Oliver Twist, an illustration of Oliver Twist in, from 1879. You can see the, the Jew, uh, Fagin, and a, and a Christian girl, uh, very similar uh, here to, to that uh, iconography. Oops, uh, I guess this is what I did add that slide. Uh, here is a German postcard, uh, and you can see um, now, this is also the twist on the elder shall serve the younger and that Jews, uh, Christians should not sh serve Jews because they are superior. And here's obviously a Jewish family or Jewish gathering uh, and a German woman who is uh, visually different uh, is serving them. So it's again, it's tying back to that idea of, of, of servitude and, 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 and power uh, and, and sort of this is the upset order. And note that the Jew, Jewish figures are disfigured, darker, uh, bigger lips, uh, bigger noses, uh, in, in kind of, again, similar uh, patterns. Here is a postcard from Poland, which uh, is a joke uh, that, you know, Jews are trying to um, even dress in folk clothing but it doesn't fit them, doesn't suit them. Niedotwarze in, in this thing. And of course the, the faces are darker and disfigured and, and racialized in that way. And it would have been very easily picked up by people who would buy such a postcard because there were ubiquitous postcards showing the sort of Polish uh, 
you know, folk, people dressed in, in folk clothing. And again, their aesthetic, the faces are very uh, different. And here you, of course, have uh, um, examples of Jews being expelled to Palestine um, a, or, or uh, that they should go to Palestine. That's where they below the sort of the Europeanization of Jews in the, the early 20th century German postcards. Um, here is an, uh, a postcard from France that says that you, you, the Jew should, you would never be, you can never be naturalized. You can never become French effectively uh, in, this, in this way. Um, and then we have these kind of parallel tropes of, 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 of racialization. The lecherous black man who is uh, ogling uh, white women. And then you have the lecherous Jew, which is ubiquitous in anti-Semitic literature. And in a similar, again, aesthetic contrast of the, the Jew ogling the, uh, the, the, the young, um, young non-Jewish European uh, women. And then the, the stormer, the Nazi newspaper just run with, run with it um, in, in, in this way. So there are similarities and there are also differences that emerge from these different contexts of, uh, of what, it, uh, what it means, but the, the modes of transmission are very similar happening at the same time in, in similar way. And today too, especially in, in the United States, we see these uh, these connections and echoes. Uh, we had in 20, uh, 20, 2008, um, a, a TV ad run by the Republican National Co uh, Convention um, that singled out George Soros and as a found, founder, uh, connoisseur of chaos, uh, founding chaos and racial, uh, racial um, justice issues that this is all fomented by Jews. And, and then again, the sort of power and money uh, idea of usurped place in society. This of course is not new. Civil rights era in the United States was seen as funded uh, by, by Jews and, uh, and also same tropes in the Nazi uh, propaganda. So um, the these uh, again, what what putting those together made me realize both the similarities and the differences between them, and also how these discourses were uh, were intertwined. They the, the, one doesn't necessarily emerge from the other, but they have common root of that uh, Christian supersessionism and Christian superiority that then is uh, deployed both through culture and law. In different uh, in different contexts, and again, this QR code will get you to. You can download the introduction and the table of contents. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions.